You know, and for some of you, I know that many of you have struggled maybe with addiction or of some type or known someone has, but for maybe for some of you, it's completely foreign. And so we don't, we don't talk about the past to bring glory to the past. We talk about the past to let you see that God is capable of literally doing anything. If you've ever known anybody in addiction, let me tell you something. It's walk, being the walking dead. You know, there was a time in my life where my life was so destroyed with addiction that I was like a zombie. All I wanted to know was if I could get this certain person on the phone and I could drive this certain place. And my life was inside of this little box. I mean, when I started doing drugs, it was for freedom. I thought I was opening my mind. And, but really what I did was I, I forsaked freedom and bought into slavery. I made myself a slave to sin to a degree that was even beyond, fully grown beyond what, what normal sin. And it was like full grown sin to the point where I didn't want to go on anymore. I wanted to die, but Jesus reached down to where I was. Jesus reached down to where James was and where Josh was and where Travis was. And listen, for many of you, Jesus has reached down to where you are. But when you look at a story like James's or like mine, what I want it to give you is hope. The fact that wherever you are today, even if the situation's completely, there's no possible human way that God can reach down to where you are and save you. Christ is mighty to save. And that's the reason why we tell these stories, not to bring glory to ourselves or say, look at us. It's to say, look what the Lord has done. In 1 Corinthians, it says, listen, not many of you are wise or strong or influential, but God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wisdom of the wise. So if you're one of those really smart people that's got it all together, it's gonna be harder for you it's going to be harder for you. That's just like in the story of the rich young ruler when, it, when he talks about it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of heaven. He's not saying money's bad. He's saying, listen, if you think that you got control, if you think that you're supporting yourself, if you think you've got it all together, it's going to be a lot harder for you than it is for the person who's broken. There's only one kind of good soil and it's broken soil. All right, let's turn to our Bibles uh, in the book of Matthew real quick. Matthew chapter 16. I hope this don't make Josh mad, but he, he put in human concerns. But the title of the sermon is actually Human Concerns and the Concerns of God. I'm just kidding. I know it wouldn't make you mad. I'm just being funny. Um, we're leaving. <laughs> Are you coming back for lunch? <laughs> Amen. But angrily. So turn with me to Matthew 16, 21. So I'm reading out of the New International Version. Matthew 16, 21 says this. From that time, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have it concerns the, the you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then Jesus said to his disciples, "Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it." What good will it be for someone to gain the world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what could anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with the angels and then reward each person according to what they have done. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord, the most uh, important revelation of yourself that you've given us, Lord, that helps us conform to the image of your son. Lord, I pray that your spirit, God, will, will use your word to conform us to the image of Christ, Lord. Lord, help us see things the way you see things, God. Lord, to see ourself the way you see us, God, and so that our life and our mind will, will live a life of worship based on the scripture, empowered by the Holy Spirit, made possible by Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection in Jesus name amen so let's think about this for a minute the scripture that I just read Peter 
one of Jesus' disciples is walking along with Jesus. And Jesus is saying, listen, I'm about to head up that hill very soon to die on a cross. This is where my life is aiming. This is where I'm heading. And Peter says, no, I'm not gonna let that happen. It says he rebuked him. (laughs) Peter rebuked Jesus. Hey, this wasn't the first time Peter rebuked Jesus. Peter also rebuked Jesus or at a later point when, when Jesus said, hey, listen, I'm gonna wash your feet. And Peter said, oh no, you're not gonna wash my feet. Peter knew a lot of stuff, you know. He thought he was honoring God actually in a lot of things that he did, but he, his mind was on human concerns, not God's concerns. I want you to think about this. What if you were standing there with Jesus and you were arguing with him and he looked at you and said, get behind me, Satan. That probably hurt my feelings a little bit, to be honest with you. Get behind me, Satan. See, the spiritual reality is something that's always been and always will be. We are consumed with the temporal reality of this world, but it's passing away. See, Jesus sees things through the eyes of eternity. Let's scroll back in our scripture for a minute here. So Jesus is rebuking Peter in a very harsh and direct fashion. But if you go back to Matthew 16, verse 13, interestingly, like the very section of scripture right above that, it says, Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And they replied, John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But what do you say, he asked, who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you, whatever is bound loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone else that he was the son of man, that he was the Messiah. So moments before Jesus rebukes Peter, he gives them, him the most amazing confirmation of a spiritual revelation that he had. I mean, listen, what an amazing declaration where Peter looks at the fleshly Jesus Christ on earth and says, you are the Messiah. And in that moment, that revelation is confirmed by Jesus himself. You are right, Peter. Whoa, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. That was revealed to you by the Father in heaven. And you know what, Peter, on that confession, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell's not going to prevail against it. Woo! Your profession of faith validated by Jesus. And then moments later, he's rebuked in a very harsh fashion. Get behind me, Satan. Peter is validated in his confession of who Jesus is, but a few verses later, he's rebuked in a very direct fashion. His intentions were called into question. He was called demonic. Why? Why would Jesus rebuke Peter so harshly and so directly? And I want you to hear this. Because anything that stands in the way of the cross must be rebuked. Peter tried to stop or cartel the gospel itself, although he didn't realize it. And let's be honest. Peter was concerned about human concerns. See, Jesus had showed up on the scene and they were oppressed and they were enslaved to the Roman people and the Jews wanted this Messiah to come and set up an earthly kingdom. You know, if you look back and when Jesus' conversations with the apostles, they're asking him questions like, hey, who will be greatest in your kingdom? Who gets to sit on your right and your left side? Who gets to be the big shot? When you set up this earthly kingdom, how can we be some of the top dogs in this? How do we fit in? Who are we in the kingdom? See, that they were looking at God's kingdom in a very narrow fashion. Peter tried to stop Jesus from going to the cross and he was rebuked. When Christians or any version of Christianity does anything to undermine the cross, listen, we get all divided over a whole bunch of stuff that don't even matter. 
The most important message of Christianity is Jesus' death and resurrection that brings salvation to us eternally. So if we're going to divide up over if he's coming back after the tribulation or before it, or if we're supposed to, you know, take the tithe and offering up in the front of the church or the back or where the prayer partners stand or if you should have carpet or should sing hymns or modern worship. This is nonsense. The only doctrine that really matters. I'm not saying that no other doctrines in the Bible matter. I'm saying that every doctrine that's a step away from the cross or a step away from the cross matters less and less. Nothing can stand in the way of the cross and anything that does, and I, I hate to use this word, must be rebuked and rejected. Let's talk about Peter's confession real quick. Peter made a, a true and real confession of faith. What does Romans 10, 8 say? But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. The message concerning faith, this is what we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. It is with your heart you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth you confess and are saved. So he made a, a positive, proper, real confession. And my friends, let me tell you, the church is full of people who make a proper and real confession of who Jesus Christ is. We honor him with our words and our mouths. You are the Messiah. You are Jesus. But Jesus adds a very interesting thing to his rebuke of Peter. What does belief look like? Well, here's what belief looks like. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. Peter, if you want to hold on to this, this life that you have planned for yourself, you're going to lose it. Here's the thing. He rebukes him by saying, listen, you're concerned about human concerns. Not God's concerns. What are God's concerns? The most important concern of God is this, to seek and save sinners. That's what, that's what Jesus came here for. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. So we have to rebuke or reject anything that stands in the way of the cross. In my own life, listen, I've, I, can get, I can get detracted into some side secondary issue just like anybody else. But the truth is, is me as a preacher of the gospel, God has laid it on my heart to not let politics or social economics or secondary biblical issues take me away from the focus that I have to seek and save that which is lost. So where should we reject anything that comes in the way of the cross? Well, first and foremost, in our own life. What is standing between you and the gospel? Not just your declaration or your words of faith, but an action that says you actually believe them. See, Jesus is saying, listen, you can say whatever you want with your mouth, but if you really believe that I'm the Messiah, follow me. Follow me. Very quickly here. If you want to take any points down, here they are. We have to die to human concerns in our life that stand in the way of the cross. You know, we're, the, 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 the Christianity in our relationship with God is compared to a marriage sometimes. You know, when people say, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me, people go, oh man, that's heavy. I thought God was all about love. He is. Passionate love. Real love. Look, when I stood, and I've said this many times when I preach, when I stood in front of people declaring my love for my wife, I declared it by saying, I forsake all others. I'll stick with you if you're rich, if you're poor, you're sick, you're well. I'm going to stand by your side. And this is basically the same declaration we're making to God. Listen, no matter what comes, if I abase or if I'm abound, if I'm rich, if I'm poor, if I'm up and I'm down, in season, out of season, I will follow you. See, the difference between having a relationship with your husband or your wife and with Jesus is in that relationship, you're the only imperfect one. Whatever he says is the right way. And guess what? If your concerns are on the concerns of God, his concerns are on you. We focus about how we're going to handle this one little situation. 
God, and we, we, God, if you really love me, this is going to work out how I want it to work out. In some relationship that you're desperate to hold on to. God sees everything from the top. Some job that you think defines you as a person. Some situation in your life. If, if God really loved me, he would answer the prayer the way I wanted him to. And Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan. Not you, but get behind me the tr lack of trust, the lack of faith that says, you know better than I do. See, God is love is not the gospel. It's easy to tell somebody God loves them. Hey, God loves you. Well, great. Whatever sort of idolatrous version of God I got in my mind loves me. Money. The gospel isn't God loves you. The gospel is God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you so that you wouldn't imperish and, 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 and bring on yourself the wrath of the sin that you actually deserve. God didn't send his son to the world to condemn the world. He wasn't condemning Peter. He was rebuking him for the sake of restoration. You know, we, we can give Peter a real hard time here, but I'll tell you something. Peter didn't have something we have, the resurrection. We see everything in light of the resurrection. You know, Peter just knew that Jesus, the same thing with Mary. How many of you know the story of when Lazarus died and Jesus shows up and he comes to, to Martha and Mary and he goes to Martha and he says, hey, listen, I'm the resurrection and the life. And she goes, well, I know on that day, all will rise here in Christ and the dead will rise and uh, you are Lord and amen. He's like, no, listen, these ain't words. I am the word. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So when I look at a man who walks into my ministry, who tells me, Listen, you don't understand my situation. You don't understand my son's situation, my husband's situation. He's got a needle in his arm. He stole all our money. He's tried to kill himself. I say, listen, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. I'm sorry the last rehab didn't work. I'm sorry that you guys couldn't figure it out on your own. I'm sorry that your human concerns are so blinding that you can't step back and see that God has the concerns of eternity. Dying to human concerns that stand in the way of the cross individually. Listen, rebuking any form of Christianity that stands in the way of the cross. So the word rebuking is weird because we think it means like rebuking, like, hey, you, come here. The word rebuke in the Bible is never used in a context of, of judgment, really. Rebuking is for the sake of restoration. Correction is for the sake of, of growth. What does it say in, in the book of 2 Timothy? It says, listen, preach the word, correct, rebuke, and encourage with pa great patience and careful instruction. This isn't a message to people who aren't in Christ. This is a message to people who are in Christ. Rebuking you because you're, you're wrong. God wants to change your perspective and point you back to the cross. We don't have a ton of time, but I just want you to focus on this. If you don't take anything away from this, take, we have to focus on what stands in the way, what human concerns stand in the way of us personally and the cross. And then in our church, we have to ask, what are we doing as a church? I don't just mean overflow, I mean in the church. What's standing in the way of the gospel? I've had some Facebook conversations with people that I think I was right about that stood in the way of the gospel, stood in the way of the cross. Listen, we live in America and I'm so thankful that we have the freedom to vote and political parties and all this stuff. But let me tell you something. I'm never going to let that stand in the way of the gospel. That Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. I'm not saying don't be participating in, in this you know, system, of, but, but it shouldn't be the primary thing. Those are human concerns. Hey, if we just get the right guy in, he'll set everything right. We hated the last president and you hate the new president or vice versa. Who cares? Listen, we're waiting not on a new president or a new political party to raise. I'm waiting on a city whose builder and maker is God. See, we don't need a band-aid in our country. We don't need a new leader. We don't need one or the other political party to get their act together. We need someone who can bring dead things to life dead things to life. 
I know we're about out of time, but I need you to understand something. The reason why most of us don't believe, truly believe that God is a God who can do anything is because we underestimate the miraculous nature of the gospel. We think, oh, I accepted Jesus in my heart, and now I can, you know, go struggle through Christianity. Listen, if you believe that God raised a dead thing to life, that should be the precedence that starts your whole walk with God. Well, golly, I was dead in addiction. I was dead in immorality. I was lost and depressed and suicidal or whatever your story is, and God raised you up from that. That should be the view that you see everything else in Christianity through. The problem is, is we're given a version of the gospel today that says, listen, I know you don't really believe it, but just recite this prayer with your eyes closed. I don't want to inconvenience you. Just say the prayer and go live your life. I'm not any, I don't have any problem with reciting a prayer. We need to recite a prayer. My point is, that that's not the gospel. Listen, the gospel is me looking and having a conversation with you. Uh, guys that come in here and accepted Christ in their heart, but we're having conversations for three months about after that about what that means. So we've got to reject, deny, and love anything that stands in the way of the gospel. There's only one thing we have to really be bold about. It's the name of Jesus. Not our denomination not our political party, not our human concerns. Hey, we can, get, we can look back into our own family and think about our, our little family that we're, we idolize too. And then number three, and then I'm gonna close with prayer. Laying down the love of the world for the love of God and others. If you don't really understand the gospel, you probably have a distorted view of God's love. Here's what love really looks like. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Scorning its shame, he sat down at the right hand in the throne of God. See, Jesus saw the cross as a means to you and to me. Sometimes, listen, when he rebuked Peter, he didn't do it because he was mad at Peter. He said, listen, bro, I love you, son. But you don't understand what's going on here. Nothing's going to stand between me and that cross. And Jesus went to that cross, died and resurrected. And now those of us who are in Christ look to that cross and say, nothing's standing in between me and that cross. And, I, and if you want to, like James said, follow me as I follow Christ. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jew and in its foolishness to the Gentile. We never outgrow the gospel, my friends. It's not something you do once when you're a baby Christian and then you move on to the bigger things. The gospel is what we will constantly be pressing ourselves up against for the rest of our life. Saying, do I look like Christ? Is my life sacrificial? Is my bank account sacrificial? Is my time sacrificial? first to God, next to my family, and then the human concerns of yourself. But realistically, God never really talks too much about being concerned with yourself. You want to know why he says deny yourself? I hear a lot of Christians trying to talk about empowering yourself. But listen, we don't need to be told to empower ourselves. That's the nature of humanity, to, to look out for number one. That's why God says to suppress that. You worry about my business, and I'll worry about yours.